All right, this is the logical first lecture here, for those of you taking the online uh, clerkship, because what I'd like to do uh, in this lecture is go through some very basics of neurology localization. Uh, we're going to talk about basic upper and lower motor neuron findings, and this will be the, the building block. of. The uh, what we're going to do in these lectures is basically start out with muscle disease after this lecture, and we're going to work our way all the way up uh, to the brain. And uh, we're going to add, of course, a lot of clinical information. Uh, and so a lot of this will be uh, fairly dense in this lecture. So don't be discouraged. Build on this material as we go on. But let's think about it this way. Uh, patients that present with neurologic problems, uh, weakness would be a very common symptom. And that could be due to a muscle disease. Or if we work our way up, it could be a neuromuscular problem. It could be a peripheral neuropathy. Uh, could be a plexopathy, radiculopathy, ear horn cell disease, spinal cord pathology, brain stem, subcortical white matter, or cortical. All right, so even uh, something as simple as weakness we see really could be a problem from all the way up to the brain. So I want to start out by going through some anatomy because uh, in neurology so much of it is localizing the lesion. If you know where the problem is, uh, that's half the battle. And so that's what we're going to go through quickly here in this lecture. And uh, maybe to begin, let's talk about, uh, again, just some very basics. Upper motor neuron findings and lower motor neuron findings. Okay? Uh, it's uh, probably, this is uh, one of the most foundational things uh, that you get down, very important. And so let's just go through this table that many of you are probably familiar with. Uh, first of all, what about the deep tendon reflexes or muscle stretch reflexes? Um, and, of course, in an upper motor neuron condition, our reflexes will be brisk. We'll have hyperreflexia. If we have a lower motor neuron condition, uh, the patient will lose reflexes. Uh, major pushing uh, uh, point there. Of course, if a patient has an upper motor neuron condition, they're going to be weak. And they'll be weak if they have a lower motor neuron problem. Uh, the difference here is that in an upper motor neuron condition, patients have a spastic weakness. In lower motor neuron conditions, we call this a flaccid weakness. Now, how does that appear? Uh, a spastic weakness is a, is a stiff, kind of a rigid weakness. Uh, and in fact, we, we try to distinguish this from rigidity. And uh, uh, one way is obvious. If the patient needs to have a stiff weakness and they have brisk reflexes, you know it's upper motor neuron. Uh, but the other way you can tell is a spastic weakness is velocity dependent. So in other words, if you take the patient's arm and you move it quickly, you get a catch. Okay, it's a velocity-dependent spasticity. Uh, if we have someone, uh, let's say, that has Parkinson's disease, that's not an upper motor neuron condition. Okay, they're going to have a stiff arm also. This is rigidity. Rigidity is not velocity-dependent. Okay, so uh, very different here between spasticity uh, and rigidity. And, as lower motor neuron weakness, it will be a floppy uh, type of weakness. <clears> okay, <throat> hey, what about atrophy? Uh, in an upper motor neuron condition, there's really minimal, if any, atrophy. And uh, this atrophy is just from disuse. Um, so if you've had a cast on your arm, something like that. If you don't move muscles for a long period of time, you'll get a little disuse atrophy. It's not very dramatic. On the other hand, if we have a lower motor neuron condition, let's say we have a stab wound to the ulnar nerve, we cut the nerve, uh, within weeks there's going to be profound atrophy. All right, so significant atrophy is a hallmark of a lower motor neuron condition. And we'll, we'll talk about where those lower motor neurons are. <clears throat> Here under uh, Babinski, we could add a whole bunch of other uh, upper motor neuron findings, but of course, uh, the Babinski sign where you scrape the bottom of the foot, move towards the big toe, the toe goes up, that upper motor neuron finding in lower motor neuron conditions, nothing happens. The toe moves down or uh, we have no movement at all. We could put other things in here uh, on the neurologic examination, which we'll talk about later, like clonus. It would be an upper motor neuron. Uh, we'll go through some more of those. And maybe the only other one we'll list for now, uh, fasciculation. Uh, now, we've all had fasciculations, that annoying little eyelid twitch, uh, for example. That's fasciculation. 
Uh, but fasciculations can also be seen in motor neuron conditions. So fasciculations, uh, especially as we'll discuss with uh, conditions like an anterior horn disease, ALS, uh, that's a very prominent lower motor neuron weak patients have the fasciculations, and uh, we don't have fasciculations in uh, an upper motor neuron condition. Kind of related to this, maybe we can put here uh, fibrillations, or fibs. Uh, again, we would see that uh, with a lower motor neuron condition, but to see fibrillations, to go in the EMG lab. Okay, you don't see those clinically. You only see those when a, when a needle is placed uh, in the muscle. Okay, and if you don't see fibrillations, condition. Okay, so we're going to refer uh, here to this table uh, several times here as we go through this handout. And uh, the handout which is attached to the lecture, you want to uh, download this because as we go through, you'll want to draw out and make some notes. Uh, before we go through the handout, uh, however, let me just uh, draw out the basic upper and lower motor neurons so we can kind of see what we're talking about here. <coughs> now, uh, there are lots of upper motor neuron pathways. Uh, we refer again and again to the corticospinal tract as our classic example of an upper motor neuron pathway. And so we'll use this diagram over and over again. And um, basically the landmarks here, we're going to talk about the cortex, okay, where the upper motor neurons originate. And this is the brain stem. Okay, so we have the midbrain the pons, medulla, and then the spinal cord. All right, and so the upper motor neuron pathway, the classic one, is the cortical spinal tract. Cortical spinal tract. Okay, this is our classic upper motor neuron pathway. Again, there are lots of others. But uh, the, the big picture here is if we say this is the right hemisphere of the brain. And you all know that the right brain moves the left side of the body, essentially. And how this works is the corticospinal tract travels from the right cortex uh, down through the subcortical white matter, through the midbrain, pons, medulla, and then crosses here, essentially at the junction between the medulla and the spinal cord. Okay, and then it is traveling down the opposite side of the spinal cord. And so if we have a lesion anywhere along here, whether it's cortical, subcortical, brain stem, or spinal cord, the patient will exhibit upper motor neuron findings that we just went through. Brisk reflexes, spastic weakness, clonus, ski, all of that. Okay? So we look for upper motor neuron findings with a brain, brain stem, or spinal cord condition. Okay, but what do the upper motor neurons do? They talk to lower motor neurons. So in the spinal cord, the lower motor neurons are the anterior horn cells, okay? And so, uh, well, there's a little interneuron in here, but we won't draw that out. And the anterior horn cells, of course, go out and uh, move the appropriate muscles, okay? So in the spinal cord, when we talk about lower motor neuron conditions, we're referring to anterior horn cell diseases, nerve root conditions because, of course, the nerve, nerve roots come from the anterior horn cell, the plexus, and the peripheral nerve. So this is our lower motor neuron finding. If we have any problem along here, then we're going to have atrophy, fasciculations, flaccid weakness, loss of reflexes, so on. Okay, maybe the one other point, uh, though, to make here is that we also have upper motor neurons that communicate from the cortex down brainstem. Okay? And uh, generally these are both crossed and uncrossed. And this pathway, I'll just put CBT here for the cortical bulbar tract. The bulb is the brainstem. So this pathway goes from the cortex to the brainstem. Because what's in the brainstem? Well, um, these anterior horn cells all the way up through the spinal cord. Okay, but the motor nuclei in the brainstem are just rostral continuations of these anterior horn cells. So, for example, uh, the hypoglossal nerve. It's a lower motor neuron. It's like an anterior horn cell, except in this case it talks to the tongue. Uh, we'll talk about cranial nerve 6 and 7 um, here in the pons. Okay, so the cortical bulbar tract is an upper motor neuron pathway. 
specifically talks to lower motor neurons in the brainstem. Okay, and so we'll go through in this lecture, we'll put lots of different lesions here and there uh, to, to kind of uh, begin to round out uh, how we distinguish between these upper and lower motor neuron conditions. All right, so let's start with our first um, case here and uh, think through this and let's see if we can uh, try to localize the problem. So the first part of it is just the stem, okay, and then we're going to change the scenario and see how that changes the lesion. All right, so our first case here is a 72-year-old woman with a history of diabetes and hypertension who suddenly awakens with weakness of the right face, arm, and leg. Okay, several clues here. Um, anytime in neurology if there's a sudden onset problem, that's generally vascular. Okay, so we're you know, some sort of cerebrovascular etiology. Okay, and so she awakens with right face, arm, and leg weakness. And weakness on one side of the body is hemiplegia. Okay, so this case be a differential of hemiplegia. What do we find on exam? Well, moderate weakness of the right face, arm, and leg associated with reflexes on the right, right extensor plantar response, so right Babinski. Okay, so clearly this is for motor neuron. And so our question here is, if we look here at the cortical spinal tract, where's the lesion? Is it cortical? Is it subcortical? Is it brainstem? Or uh, is it spinal cord? Okay, because of course if you had a spinal cord lesion, let's say way up in the neck, now that could produce weakness on one side. All right, so uh, let's go through our different uh, scenarios here and let's see if we can figure this out. First of all, what if the additional exam finding? We know she's weak on the right side of the body, but let's say that you find sensation is normal. Okay, a very important clue. It kind of intuitively, if someone has a weak arm, uh, you're expecting to find some sensory abnormalities also. But what if sensation is normal? Okay. Um, Let's deal with uh, cortical, first of all. Could this be a cortical process? And if we just look at the surface of the brain, okay, and we'll magnify this part of the brain here. Uh, remember we have our uh, central sulcus and our motor and sensory uh, cortex here, which is face and arm, face and arm, and remember the leg fibers are more medial. And so, uh, uh, perhaps some of you were thinking, well, this is probably a cortical stroke, like middle cerebral artery stroke. And you'll recall that the middle cerebral artery comes out here through the sylvian fissure, and it supplies uh, the large portion of the lateral hemisphere of the brain. But the reason this case, at least in our first scenario, it's, this is not likely, is the middle cerebral artery supplies both motor and sensory on the lateral surface of the brain. So if we had a, a cortical stroke, we would always expect to have motor and sensory. All right, so th this would suggest we're not dealing with a cortical stroke. Um, well, what about if the lesion were in the brain stem? Um, and uh, again, the reason that wouldn't be likely is anytime you have something going on in the brain stem, and uh, we'll round out more what this looks like, but there's so much here in the brain stem, you'd expect to have cranial nerves involved, other sensory pathways, um, and so we just don't have anything else that would suggest this is likely to be brainstem. What about spinal cord? Well, again, you involve sensory pathways in the spinal cord, uh, but of course the other thing is this patient has facial weakness. So if you're adjusting the lesions down in the spinal cord, that would not explain why the face is weak. The lesion would have to be at least um, as far up as the midbrain. All right, so what this patient has is a subcortical stroke. And here we need to understand a little bit of anatomy of the subcortical region, but uh, the reason this case is so important is this is one of the most common stroke syndromes that we see. And the lesion here in this first scenario is in the internal capsule. Uh, recall the internal capsule has an anterior limb, has a genu or a bend, and a posterior limb. And here at the genu, the cortical bulbar tract travels. Recall that's, again, cortex to brainstem. Um, adjacent to it here in the posterior limb is the cortical spinal tract. So these two pathways travel right together um, here in the uh, internal capsule. 
And back here in the posterior limb, well, let's draw the thalamus here. Recall that uh, all the sensory information, the, the pathway will draw out, such as for pain, temperature, vibration, they're all headed up to the thalamus. I guess we can just put here the specific nucleus as VPL of the thalamus. Okay, and these pathways on their way up to sensory cortex travel, um, I'll put an S here for sensation, the pathway is called the thalamocortical radiations, but this sensory pathway also travels up uh, through the posterior limb. So uh, maybe intuitively you might think, well, these are right next to each other, so we should have motor and sensory involvement. Okay, but the reason we don't is that the vascular supply here is different. Later on we'll have a lecture on stroke, we'll go into detail about all the blood vessels, but this portion of the internal capsule is supplied by a blood vessel known as the lenticulodriate. Okay, so if we have an occlusion of this blood vessel, as commonly occurs in diabetic hypertensive patients, patients present with contralateral facial weakness, especially lower face, and contralateral arm and leg weakness, but because the vascular supply here to the sensory fibers is different, there's no sensory involvement. Okay, so this is known as a pure motor stroke, and again, very common in patients that have diabetes and hypertension. All right, so the, the second part of the scenario here is, what if there are sensory deficits in the weak extremities? What if it's motor and sensory? And as a rule, that would suggest this, this is more likely cortical. Okay, you have more information to support that, uh, but if it's motor and sensory together, that would suggest more likely we're dealing with a middle cerebral artery stroke. Okay, now what, what happens in your handout here is we add now different dimensions. What if you find this? What if you find this? And so the next one here is, what if you find uh, the patient has an associated Broca's aphasia? Okay, now where are the language uh, areas in the brain? It's non-dominant left hemisphere, all right? So um, if we, the patient has right-sided weakness and a Broca's aphasia, and if we just look at the lateral surface of the brain here, face and arm, face and arm, okay? And so as the middle cerebral artery comes out to supply these areas, Broca's area is, maybe I could just draw it right here, all right? But it's, it's on the inferior frontal gyrus. And so if we have a stroke involving the superior division of the middle cerebral artery, we'll have a patient who has contralateral weakness and sensory loss, Broca's aphasia. We'll talk about the aphasias later, but uh, Broca's is the expressive language area. So a patient with a Broca's aphasia uh, generally can't get very many words out. They may have, not be able to get a sound out, or they may just have a very limited uh, vocabulary. But, uh, but certainly the presence of a Broca's aphasia would tell you, ah, this is a cortical stroke, and in this case, uh, the muscles, the left middle cerebral artery. Okay, now the next scenario is, what if the eyes are deviated toward the left? Uh, here in a few minutes, we're going to draw this diagram out for now. Uh, but, but for now, let me just make a big picture point about this. Uh, here in the middle frontal gyrus, um, we have an area known as the frontal eye fields. Okay, and uh, essentially what happens is the right eye fields are trying to drive the eyes to the left, the left frontal eye fields are trying to drive the eyes to the right. Normally they're equally counterbalanced, okay? But if you have a destructive lesion like a stroke that would involve the left frontal eye fields, okay, now the eyes can't look to the right and so they get driven to the left, okay? So a patient that has weakness on one side and the eyes are looking away from the hemiplegia, okay, that's known as a gaze preference, okay? And that can really only localize um, in the brain. We, this is not a brainstem problem. Okay? And, and in this case, fits very well uh, with a left middle cerebral artery stroke. Okay, again later, we'll draw that out. Okay, now, uh, going back to our stem here of this patient with a right hemiplegia, what if you find that the patient has a left third nerve palsy? Well, and, and here we need to come back 
uh, to this diagram, except since we're saying the patient has um, right-sided weakness, I'm just going to change right and left. Okay, so this is our left cortical spinal tract. And uh, if a patient has a right, um, I'm sorry, a left third nerve palsy, recall that cranial nerves 3 and 4 are in the midbrain. So if we have a lesion here in the left midbrain, the patient's going to have a left third nerve palsy. Okay, and what that looks like is the eye is deviated down and out, the pupil's big, is mydriasis, and we have very severe ptosis. And as we go through the neurologic examination, uh, we'll, we'll talk a lot about the third nerve palsy. Now we're just trying to localize the lesion. And so the point is, for now, if we have a lesion here in the left midbrain, we're going to get a left third nerve palsy. Cranial nerves don't cross. They stay on the same side. The only exception is the fourth cranial nerve, uh, and that really doesn't matter clinically. So if we have a lesion on one side of the brain stem, our cranial nerve deficits are going to be same side. Right? But notice here that if we involve the left cortical spinal tract in the midbrain, okay, this pathway has not crossed yet. All right? So if we have a lesion in the left midbrain, the patient is going to have right-sided weakness. Okay? So the right side of the body is weak but we've got a left third nerve palsy. And very important that you get this because this is the hallmark of any brainstem syndrome that you can think of, which is ipsilateral cranial nerve problems, contralateral arm and leg, motor in this case, or sense deficits. So it's a dramatic crossed finding, ipsilateral cranial nerve, contralateral motor or sensory. Okay, so our localization in this case would be the left midbrain. This is known as Weber's syndrome. Okay, what if we had a left sixth and seventh nerve palsy? Well, cranial nerves six and seven are in the pons. Okay, so, and they're in the pons, they, they are right next to each other. When they exit the pons, they're far apart. But in the pons, the, the facial nerve pathway travels right around the abducens nucleus. So if we had a lesion right here in the left pons, the patient will have an ipsilateral 6th and 7th nerve palsy. Okay, what would that look like? Well, the 6th nerve supplies the lateral rectus muscle. Okay, so if I have a left 6th nerve palsy, when I try to look to the left, the left eye is not going to move. And so I'm going to have double vision every time I try to look to the left. Um, if I have a left 7th nerve palsy, Seventh nerve, of course, controls the muscles on one side of the face. So, to raise the eyebrow, uh, to wrinkle the talus muscle, and there'll be a facial droop. Okay, so we'll have a left sixth and seventh nerve palsy. But notice again that the weakness, because the cortical spinal tract hasn't crossed, the weakness is opposite side. So again, crossed finding. Ipsilateral, sixth and seventh nerve palsy, contralateral weakness. And if you know where the cranial nerves are, you could say quite confidently uh, the lesions in the pond. Again, why is this practical? Why don't you just say, well, let's just get a scan. Let's not uh, worry about the pathways. Um, well, if you do a CT scan in this patient, the CT does a lousy job of looking at the ponds. So if you have quickly localized the lesion and said, ah, the lesion has to be in the ponds, well, get an MRI scan. MRI is going to be your sensitive test if you're trying to look at that area of the brain. So uh, the last case in this scenario is if you have a tongue deviated towards the left. Patient sticks their tongue out, and it, instead of straight forward, it goes off to the left. And of course, here in the medulla, we have the uh, hypoglossal nucleus and nerve. And again, let's just think about this. If we have a lesion here in the left medulla that affects the left hypoglossal nucleus, Okay, to uh, understand what happens in tongue deviation, uh, each hypoglossal nerve supplies half the tongue, and each half the tongue wants to point to the midline. Okay, so if you destroy the left hypoglossal nucleus, when the patient stick their tongue out, the right side of the tongue is going to push the tongue to the left. Okay, so if we have a left medullary lesion, the tongue will point to the left. But again, same thing, the pathway has not crossed yet the cortical spinal tract. So the patient is still going to have weakness on the opposite side.
So the patient will have right-sided weakness. The tongue will be pointing off in this direction. Okay? So um, this first case kind of went through hemiplegia from a cortical uh, down through a brainstem um, level. And again, uh, much more emphasis 